All right, so Jonathan and Kevin, thank you guys for jumping on the show. We appreciate it. How you doing? Doing well, man. How are you? Uh, so just so people can match voices, go ahead and introduce yourself and what you do in Urban Heat. Uh, my name is Jonathan Horstman, and I am the uh, vocalist, guitarist in uh, Urban Heat. And I'm Kevin Nakan. I do uh, synths, guitar, uh, a little bit of vocals uh, in Urban Heat. I'm like the utility guy. The jack of all trades guy. Master of none. Yeah. <laughs> And a true master knows he's never actually a master. True. And we're missing one member. Yeah, Pax. Paxel Foley, P A X. He plays bass, synth. Overall, good guy. Just a really good guy. Cool. Yeah. Shout out just, to Just love that guy. So you guys are. What would you call yourself? It's kind of like synth pop, dark wave, a mixture of. There's like some little bit of goth in the vocals there i always i always say that the we exist at the intersection of dark wave synth pop and post-punk um i actually just stumbled across like a, a reddit thread that was like how is urban heat considered goth and it was really interesting to see um the different kind of genres and subgenres that we were kind of thrown into but i think for right now, at least the, the music that we've released so far kind of exists in that sort of space. Yeah, oh, I, I definitely, um, I would put you in all three of those categories easily. Like lyrically, you have very fucking dark lyrics at points in songs, you know what I mean? And that's it's very gothy to me, dark sounding, gothy sounding. Mm -hmm. I don't know why yeah. that. People get really strange about genres. Yeah, though, some too. genres get real weird and diluted. Yeah, so it's, yeah. Hard, it's hard to tell really who's what well, anymore. Well, for some folks, unless there's like a jangly, um, like jangly kind of uh, chorused out guitar, then it's hard for them to like. You know what I mean? They're yeah. Like, oh, if it's goth, if it's goth, it has to have. But then classically, like all of the like quote unquote goth bands have said very strongly that they are not goth bands. So. <laughs> right. You kind of, that's sort of like the rite of passage also is to sort of deny <laughs> being in that genre. Right. It is strange. I think uh, for a lot of people, the the ownership part comes from like an identity kind of thing that they're like, you know, tied to that so much. I think for us, like, we were literally in punk bands before. So it's the term post-punk. And I know, I know it's more of an era of like late 70s, early 80s, because a lot of the band, the art bands that were doing, that were creating what would be later known as punk started doing something else. So that became post-punk. But like for us, we really didn't come into it thinking of a particular genre or quote unquote scene we'd get accepted or be a part. It, a lot of it had to do with Jonathan's way of writing songs and then the type of equipment that ended up being used was so similar to a lot of those acts in the late seventies and eighties with like Lind drums and analog synths that the sound just kind of came that way naturally. And then his deep like baritone voice kind of lent itself to a lot of those like pairings where people would say, Oh, this sounds like, you know, Bauhaus or something, you know, or Depeche Mode or something, you know? So a lot of that just kind of just happened <laughs> to be honest. And that's, you know, that's, um, where I think a lot of a lot of people have like that punk rock background and then they just deviate to different genres or they just you know, everybody likes different shit and that ends up coming out, you know what I mean? And yeah, I think no that's doubt. I think that's you know, real fucking cool. That's what what like the podcast why we do it. Ryan and I fucking are into so many different styles of music, you know what I mean? It's not and it's like the genre things kinda it's just hard to define, you know what I mean? Yeah. I really, uh, like for me, I get a little taken back by people who are only in the one type of music because I, as much as I get it, it's like they found their, their thing, you know, and, um, but like that identity thing, like makes, you know, I feel like they're in it for different reasons. Cause if you love music, you can find something that resonates with you in any genre and totally. like there's good shit in any type of music any kind of creative uh you know sound that that any artist you know so i mean teach his own yeah. but 
I love so much different music. I think we all came to the table with uh, passions for so much different uh, music and uh, genres that like the fact that we're doing this is just it, it's kind of fun to like do something that we can kind of play around with different things, you know. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. all the different and... sounds and layers and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds great, man. Yeah, because if you, you know, there's there's footage out there of, uh, you know, backstage dance parties with, like, Twin Tribes and Vision Video and stuff, and it's, like, very much, like, very considered, you know, accepted as goth bands, but, like, the way that we all blow off steam and everything backstage is, like, it's not always goth music, you know? Everybody's just there's music for different moods and for different times. Yeah, I, um, I enjoyed the ballad on the new album actually. At least I, I kind of took it as a ballad, you know. Yeah, that's one of my favorite pieces too. Say the words. Yep. Uh, track yeah, eight. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's got one of my favorite moments on the record for sure in it. it sounds like like this album I felt like was a lot more synth heavy than the first one. And I don't know if so you guys far, did anything differently or not, but there's did, a, um yeah, like he said, so far. Go ahead, Jay. Yeah, did were you able to hear the whole did anybody send you like the whole record or have you just heard the singles? Yeah, we they sent uh the publicist sent us the record. Oh, dope, dope. Yeah, I mean there's definitely there's a lot of synth going on. It's also, <laughs> to be honest, I didn't use um I hadn't started using on the first record, I was really, I wanted every synth sound that was on there to be a real, to be an analog synthesizer, right? Uh, and we were limited by that palette and it was really cool and fun. And this last record, I, you know, Arturia has their um, their whole effects collection and there's their synth, their, um, their recreated sort of Modeling. digital synths. Yeah, their modeled synths. And I really, it, it's kind of like what Kevin had said with the sound itself, like, because of the instruments that we were using kind of shaped that first record. And so I think the sound kind of has evolved because of that also, like just embracing what we are able to do digitally with the modeling. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, how can you not take advantage of it? You know what I mean? It's endless. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, plus, it's a lot cheaper to have all those plugins versus trying to track right. down that actual equipment. And like, don't so even get started <laughs> yeah, trying right. to uh, tour with that kind of gear and stuff. Oh, yeah, my oh, God. Yeah, let yeah. alone, yeah, I, would think, I didn't even think about taking all that shit on stage, fuck man. Yeah, you'd need oh, your own, uh, you need one, your own this, dedicated trailer for that, for sure. Right, and it, and they're very expensive uh, machines now, you know, and... and yeah. Yeah, and, and fragile and, and, and yeah, like well, yeah, exactly. Fragile. One little thing goes wrong, and, and you out of a few grand, you know. Yeah, definitely not cool. I watched this thing on Apple Music or Apple TV called the. It was that Mark Ronson thing that had us. I can't remember the name of it, but it had an episode about how like since we're invented and stuff, and it was cool to see like going back to when they were first made, how there was just like dials playing with frequencies and mm -hmm. then it came to be like into an actual machine and just the lineage of it was really cool to hear about. Yeah. So when did you guys start Urban Heat? Um, I think 2019 was sort of like the, the beginning of everything right before the pandemic. Um, okay. I, I had a bunch of songs that I wanted to play and came to Kevin and uh he was like packs to be perfect for this and we kind of like grabbed packs and kind of forced him <laughs> kind of forced him to jump into it and um yeah and then the pandemic hit and so we i kind of just went into the lab like i went to north carolina to um to quarantine with my wife's family and brought a bunch of recording equipment out there because I, I wasn't going to let the pandemic sort of stop me from making this record and just kind of focused on on recording those songs and and uh, connecting with an online audience because that's the only thing you could do during the pandemic. You know, right. you know, we couldn't go out and play shows. And that's how I had always thought of when you think of promoting a band, like I hadn't really jumped on to the social media sort of aspect of things yet. And so just really or at least i didn't utilize it to the best that it could be utilized for 
for promotion and just sharing art. And uh, yeah, so just dug into that until we were able to, to start playing again. And when things opened up, we just kind of hit the ground running. We were able to, to connect with enough people online during the pandemic that people actually cared about what we were doing. And um, we had some really great opportunities just right out the gate as soon as shows came back. And um, yeah, we wasted no time in just like getting out there as fast as we could. None of us are, you know, we're not spring chickens. We've done this for a really long time with other projects. And we knew that with this band, we wanted to to take everything that we had learned from all those other projects and actually apply it, you know? So we didn't want to be just a local Austin band. We didn't want to just be focusing on playing those shows, um, which was, you know, the stuff that came up through the pandemic and the importance of of connecting with a fan base online kind of, has, has stayed with the, with the project. And uh, yeah, so from 2019 to what, 2024, it's kind of, it was, it's five years, but we had that period of arrested development where, you know, the band hadn't, we weren't really, really active as a, as a project until I guess 2022, 2021, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. That looks like, like when the first full length release was out, was around then. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you guys do, if anything, differently on this new record? Like, did you use a different studio or different equipment or mm. writing process that's a, a little different? Yeah, that's a good question. The writing process is pretty... Jonathan refer- uh, yeah. Jonathan had a uh, moment where um, he was channeling something in some black magic chamber <laughs> and uh, got all these songs and recorded them. Uh, when we got back from a tour and uh, what was it like 10 days? So yeah, that's how it happened. Yeah. The second, so the first <laughs> record was like trying to figure out our sound sort mm-hmm. of, and, and just writing songs over the course of, you know, six months to a year. And then the second record was, was then informed by that process of putting a record out and connecting with people and spending so much time on tour Um that uh, yeah, we got back in December of 2022 and just ended up. Um, I just kind of dropped a record and yeah, it was about about ten days. Kind of wrote and did most of the tracking for it. Had those demos done. What we've always done is you know our demos. I would demo things in the home studio and then a lot of those sounds we would we would keep when we went into a studio with a producer. Um, the Wellness album was produced well they've both been co-produced because i'm you know, the band is so hands-on with it but we had jonas wilson out of bass drop and he so interesting that you talked about the synth sounds on the second record so wellness was produced by jonas wilson who he is a guitarist and producer and it, i feel like wellness has a very austin sound he has a very austin approach to music where it's very guitar driven guitar based and you're always thinking about how things are going to shape around the guitar um at least in my in my opinion of of the way that that a lot of awesome producers produce um we went to la to work with a guy named ben greenspan on this second record and he's somebody who's he's produced a lot of he's produced rock but he's also done a lot of hip-hop and so that was something that we wanted to do we wanted to think about the low end we wanted to treat some of the production more in a hip-hop way and less of a rock and roll way um, to kind of get more of a modern sound. And so I think that probably has a lot to do with, with it being so much more synth forward on, on the tower. That's interesting that you mentioned a hip hop producer because there, there are some dirty fucking sounding drums in there. You know what I mean? And, um, that Mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense now. Yeah. Well, we also brought in, um, Aaron Steele. So Ben wanted to bring some acoustic drums on it. Excuse me. I've always, I've always liked doing acoustic hats. I'll use a drum machine for our kick and snare. Uh, and then I like getting into the studio and actually playing the hats so that it's got a little bit more movement to it. And Ben wanted to take it one step further and actually layer acoustic drums with my electronic drums. Um, so Aaron Steele, and he's worked with Haley Williams from uh, Paramore. And he was in most Portugal, recently, man. For a while. Yeah. Yeah, he's done some stuff with Harry Styles. Like he's probably the most, the most impressive resume of anyone we've worked with by far so far. And it was really cool. We got to sit with him for a week in a studio here in Austin, 
um, and just watch somebody with th that much talent kind of drum to our stuff. And it's interesting because the way that he's able to blend it, I don't feel like, I feel like the energy is there with the acoustic, with the live drums, um, but it still has like a very electronic sort of, it's still rooted in electronic music. I can definitely hear it on uh, the first track, Take It to Your Grave. The high hats oh, yeah. in there sound natural and... I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, it just it, it definitely has a unique sound. And now that you said that you do it that way, it's it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like hats. I mean, there's some songs where you definitely want the hats to just be perfect. And, you know, I'm thinking about like we're going like very like 80s industrial sort of like goth club. You know, you want that people know how to move to a song based on everybody thinks about the kick and snare a lot but like i think the hat and the feel of a hat is something that gets overlooked in the way that it shapes the song and yeah like you the have... swing of it mm -hmm. exactly and and just like where you where you throw the accents and just and just the human element to it gives it this rawness which is not necessarily you know better or worse it's just a different flavor yeah it's it's, def it's definitely a cool sounding record man thank you so much I just yeah, I just like that it's so much fuller sounding than the than the previous like and everything that you said just now makes a whole lot of sense yeah. as to why. So as far as like yeah. inspiration wise, um did you guys have anything that you were looking to like as far as older music when piecing together your sound? Honestly, it's for for the tower, uh, we didn't know what it was going to sound like. We didn't know first. We didn't know it was going to be called the tower. We just knew we were going to have a record. Um, I had demoed like thirty or forty songs that kind of some are more in the synth pop sort of dark wave sort of thing. I think we were. I was trying to do a certain thing because we had been touring um, and kind of put in this sort of, in this sort of genre. And I think I was like, okay, like what does that crowd want to hear? And I was trying stuff and I just, I don't think that any of those really worked in it. And it, um, I wrote one, it was uh, you've got that edge, which is funny enough, like probably the most like pop sort of accessible sounding song on the record. I wrote that one and it had, there was something about it that just had some teeth and I liked that it blended. It went from synth pop and then it also had like the halftime breakdown and like big guitars. And I felt like that song gave me permission to go so many other places genre wise with the rest of the record to kind of bring in some of that post rock and the big guitars and stuff. And um, I was kind of just letting it drive itself. So I, I was, I was raised without, I wasn't allowed to listen to a lot of music growing up. And so when it comes to influences and what I'm looking at, I think the ways in which music that I've heard has influenced my writing, I'm not super conscious of. Um, Kevin is a lot better at articulating sort of where some of those influences have come from and what they are. Um, Cause for me, I just try to just write what's in my head. Not necessarily like it's when I, when I try to do something that's like, Oh, let me do something that's like nine inch nails meets this meets that. Like sometimes that works, but also like, I don't know. You just gotta just, be you, dude. Yeah, it boxes you in. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just gotta, basically what I do is I pull up a session, I find a drum sound that just like, I'll start with a drum sample that just slaps to something that just sounds really fucking good. And then I'll put up, pull up some bass and sounds, find something that sounds really nice with that. And then just kind of fuck around until there's, until there's something that just feels right. Um, and if it, if I, if I go back to that session and it becomes a song, then awesome. If I go back to that session and like, it hasn't become a song within like 30 minutes, I'll just, I'll just never touch it again. Um, I don't like to like slave over it. It's just like, if it feels like I have to fight for it, I, I won't work for it. I'm like always going down the path of least resistance when it comes to Now, Do you have like a melody like should... in your head when you're looking for that, that drum sound or do you have words? No. Um, no, no. At least when I'm doing like, like an exercise, sometimes, all. no, sometimes like I'll hear like a whole thing. Like if I'm driving in the car, I'll just turn, I'll just let the road noise and just hear the static of the road noise and then just try to hear melodies and sounds in that um, and do like a voice note or something and then go back to the studio and try to recreate what I was hearing. And then other times I'll just start with that drum sound, just like a purely empty palette and just see what comes. 
That's amazing, dude. Incredible. I think that works well for your writing, too, though, because you're not recreating an old sound, um, even though, you know, you can always take a sound and compare it to this, that, and the other, but everything that you're coming up with is what you're feeling at the time. I think it's important to, to do that when we're doing stuff that, writing music that, like, is obviously paying homage to stuff that's been made before, you know, because otherwise it's going to just sound so contrived, you know? There's, I think there's a lot of bands... In, in lots of genres, right? But like they get themselves so bogged down by we are this kind of a band and our sound is this that their shit just kind of, it doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't sound inspired. Like they do a really good job of doing an impersonation of like a goth band, right? But it's not something that, that it's just, it's nothing that I'm going to remember. Yeah, they're not and, pushing anything. They're not innovative. Any, there's just... I, um, they, I, yeah. there's a mil- like you just said there's a million a million bands and a million genres that, that I mean that. easy way to say that would be is there's a million goth bands that sound like The Cure Exa- exactly <laughs> yeah yeah totally or but the I know of mercy. like that too like if you're not yeah. pushing the art forward just like move out the way because there's a lot of other people that want to innovate and keep keep things moving forward and not just get stuck like recreating things you know what i mean that happens across any creative field i mean look at film where like for the last i don't know 15 20 years there's been this like rut of like you know and there's things that break through but there's been like nothing but recreations you know what hey, i mean dude, if we like, weren't doing music like, we'd be doing forward. we'd be doing movies and we're with you 100 <laughs> percent. yeah 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 it's been yeah. aside from a few it's been um it's fucking no, it is always it's, like it's they just it's insane dude we're just force fed remakes really but yeah yeah well, totally but well, like, the, music can yeah, be like the, that too though really but oh, i definitely. feel like you know because all the good all the good writing stuff moved to tv you know and series writing which right. we've got some incredible series over the last 20 years but the big the big screen has has suffered because yeah of it, the blockbuster you know? kind of died right i think people rely on that character development more across seasons versus just like maybe yeah. a couple movies true true but yeah. i don't know i love movies so like, to me like i wish there wasn't the rut right right well like well, i think that we the music you know I, yeah. I wish music that you know we had more and there's it's just it's so there's just so many acts it's, it's so oversaturated you know that it is hard to find but there are groups, I think, in every genre that are pushing the genre forward, you know, in ways that, um, you know, in the past wasn't, was, or at least in the, like, the recent past wasn't, uh, wasn't happening, you know. That's I mean, why I mentioned the layered thing. drums earlier, because it's, it's, there's so much uh, replay value in this record to me, because I always, every time I hear something different, like, in there. You know what yeah, I mean? I Where think usually that's, uh, I, that's not the case. I mean, you know what I'm. It's like usually dark no, wave is pretty, man. pretty like straightforward. You know, like an eight oh eight, and that's you know what I'm saying. It's no, just, that's really cool to hear. Replay value is something that I feel like uh, is is um, very important. Underestimated by an artist, like because like you don't want to make something so catchy that the first time you hear it it's stuck in your head and there's no more like you don't you can't just keep going back to it because it's like you absorbed it all in that that those first couple listens you know what i mean where like you just burned it out quick yeah you can like keep going back to and like you said discovering new things yeah you would think but there are people out there that are still listening to the same stuff over and over and over and and that's and that's that's the thing because everybody we all listen to music differently you yeah. know what I mean? So like, I think ideally the perfect song or like you want to strike that, that balance of like <clears throat> earworms for people who do just want to like simp out on a song and just like, go, go, go. And then also like people who are going to go deeper with it. Like you want to have like what you said, like the replay value, you know, and if you can, you can have earworms and hooks, but also like production and, and, and a way of doing things where, where you've got, you know, little, little gifts, little ear gifts here and there. Like, think that's yes, what you want to challenge. try to do yeah like a good happy medium in between mm-hmm. 
So the title for the record, you said you didn't know it was going to be called that. Does it have some sort of significance or a story behind it, or is that just what you guys <laughs> decided on? Yeah, no, so I, I had gotten a tarot reading, and the tower card wasn't pulled during the reading, but as I was leaving the coffee shop, she was like, hey, I just pulled one more card for you. It's the tower, and people are really scared of it, And um, but this is what I pulled. Take it, you know. Do what you will with that. And then the tower kept kind of coming up. It's kind of this, it's this scary card, but it's it's about the force that like brings about change. And I was just, yeah, it just felt right. It felt like we were in a tower sort of like season. And I wanted this record to be that sort of, yeah, I wanted it to be a self-fulfilling prophecy, like the force that brings about change as far as like for us personally, but also for this band um, artistically you know, the tower isn't something that's just, when you interact with the tower, like, you know it. You it know? doesn't sound Do you, like you fear it, so it's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I should fear it, probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, ride it. I mean, he made an album out of it. Exactly. So. Right? Yeah. That's probably no, the, that's also the why we're, we're, we're we chose August 16th as a release date because numerically this 16 is the, t is the number of the tower in tarot. So um, uh, okay. we had to look at what yeah. Friday this year w fell on the 16th. Um, and I think there were two, there was one that would date one date that wouldn't work. And the next one was in August. And we asked the label like, Hey, do you guys have anything, you know, what's going on August 16th? And he's like, uh, we don't have any releases. So that's like, pretty yeah. good, man. Like, right before back to school that's like a good mm -hmm. time to release yeah things, mm -hmm. I, I always thought i think so too. especially like you got i mean back in the days like people used to release in december because it was like christmas yep yep but also november and december because you'd get all those sales obviously that's not the case anymore but also for year end reviews something that's still fresh you know what i mean yep. like that could be like considered you know that was definitely like a ploy, I think, a lot of labels mm. do, where it'd be like, okay, we don't want to give it to them in January, February because they're going to forget about it by yeah. December, you know what I mean? Or January when they're making like year-end reviews and, and best ofs and shit. Yeah, when movies are trying to get Oscars and shit, I think they exactly. do the same thing. Yeah, they do dude. the same thing, yep. I never thought about it with movies. I mean, I've thought about it with music a hundred times, but yeah, I, it mm -hmm. does make sense to be in that kind of middle ground because yeah. I, I always keep a list of things that I think are going to be on my end of the year mm -hmm. list because we do like a wrap-up episode at the end of each right. year. Because if I don't, I, like something came out in January, like you said, I'll forget. <laughs> I totally forget. Yeah, all the best stuff will be from like yeah, November. It'll be like yeah. February. <laughs> and totally. yeah, you get the last three months out of the year and people are like, well, what about the rest of the year? I'm like, oh, yeah, forgot <laughs> about that. So yeah. I always write them down because otherwise it'll space my head. Yep. And then just narrow them down at the end of the year. So touring, you guys, it looks like I was pulling up tour dates here. You guys go on and start touring well you already played a show but you start really going out pretty much next week at the time of recording uh, this at least yeah next next week we have we're going to drive out to dallas we have a festival we will have two weeks back home to kind of finish up our tour prep and really just hammer in rehearsing this record and we'll fly to terminus uh, a festival in canada we'll fly up there um, while our merch guy drives the van to LA for the El Rey show, the like real kickoff show for the tour. And then we'll fly in from Canada and land in Los Angeles where we're actually shooting like a small documentary, which is really cool. A guy kind of reached out and this is something we had thought about doing kind of a live. We wanted to do a live at the Roxy record uh, when that show was at the Roxy, but the promoter um, due to ticket sales uh, switched us to a bigger venue, which is the first time in um, in our careers that that's happened, which is really, really cool. So live at the El Rey won't have the same, you know, je ne sais quoi as live at the Roxy, but we'll take it. And, and a documentary filmmaker reached out and um, he'll meet us at the, at, the, uh, at the airport and shoot for the next couple of days. Yeah, and then we are just off to the races for, I think we got three weeks and then the record release show in Austin. 
Um, we have a little bit of time off, but sort of flying out each weekend to do festivals, then hit East Coast for three weeks to a month, I think. Uh, we'll have three days off when we get back to Austin, and then we fly to Glasgow uh, to start uh, support for Malchat Doma for six weeks in Europe. And you guys are putting in the grind. That's awesome. Yeah, you know, we thought, we thought we were workhorses the last two years, man. Um, this this next six months is going to make that seem, uh, yeah, make that seem easy. That's great. You so, guys are playing with, uh, sorry, Jeremy. Oh, no, um, go ahead. You're probably going to ask almost the same thing I'm about to anyway. Maybe. Um, you guys are playing with Drab Majesty in September. Is that what you were going to ask? Yeah, yeah really? pretty much. Okay. <laughs> Sweet. Because that's awesome. Yeah, what? Is that in um Cold that's Wave. in Cold Wave? Oh Chicago. yeah, in Chicago. Yeah, yeah I was just great. I was just looking up that lineup and like Clan of Zymox is there and Drab Majesty. Yeah, we just, just a whole just bunch played of... with it. Clan of Zymox uh, in Houston. That's not horribly nice. far away. What Chicago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna ask what's uh, close for y'all on the list, if anything. Um, let me look. If there's a Detroit day, that'd be the closest. But uh, there, there will be. There is, right? There, yeah, if it's not announced yet, there will be. So, like, a bunch of the dates, because of some of these bigger dates, we September aren't 29th. able to announce the smaller ones. I okay, yeah, so we do have a Detroit one. Awesome. I don't suppose Sweet. you know what venue you're playing at off the top of your head. Off the top of my head, no, but I have my computer out. My organizational skills, um, I'm a musician. <laughs> and my my uh keeping all of this organized uh is a skill that i'm going to need to get better at is your dinner table your filing cabinet <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> no it's, uh, it's my my studio table the one the desk there that the that the music's on is also like everything else <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll oh right i don't have wi-fi where i'm at right now um i'll come back to you cool some place smalls or something no i could look it up too if i can make it i'll definitely go but september 30th is my kid's birthday so we'll see maybe i'll bring mm-hmm. him with me there you go is he gonna be able to drive then my kid no yeah, no <laughs> 14 oh shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're, we're at smalls september okay. 29th oh, that's sick, at dude. smalls is that a cool venue we like it yeah that's small or, I mean, you know, in a good way. In a good way. It's not, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's not like it's personal. a fucking huge theater or something. No, I love that. Oh. Yeah, we're we're both big fans of Drive Majesty. So, like, I was just scrolling through oh, your nice. tour dates to see, and I was like, oh, shit, they're playing a Drive Majesty show. That's fucking awesome. Yeah, we haven't seen them uh, live yet, but um, I've been looking forward, forward to. Crew World or Dark Waves. Oh yeah, they were at Dark Waves. I've seen like videos of them live, but never actually in person. And some of, some of their like live videos that they do, just like a sort of a tiny music desk thing, but not an actual tiny music desk where it's just them two like in a room and they're mm. playing something. Those videos are crazy. Like just the sounds that they get out of their music. Yeah. Plus they're just weird and interesting looking so yeah they're yeah, cool yeah. i love that demonstration mm, yeah. album i would love, the aesthetic would love to yeah, interview sure. those guys but i don't know if they even talk so. <laughs> <laughs> like, right kind of like one of those trying to talk to buckethead things yeah, like a daft punk thing yeah yeah so that's all the united states and canada have you guys done like uh europe or anything over on that side no, this will be our first time. Okay, cool. This is the first one. Even in previous bands, that's the first the first time you've been over there. Or? You know, I, I in high school I sang in, a, in competitive like choral groups. Uh, I sang in <laughs> Austria and Germany, um, but I was eighteen, and I I don't I honestly don't remember any of the trip. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you probably had a good trip then. I'd imagine so. Yeah. I remember I bought a butterfly knife. <laughs> Those are cool. <laughs> that I couldn't take on the plane. So I yeah, don't, I was going to say, there ain't no way you're going to get that back. Mm-hmm. Just ship it to yourself or something, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, so the album art that you guys have, did you 
commission somebody to do that or have somebody in mind to do it. I was trying to, I only have a small picture of it, so it's hard to get. Like, yeah. And that's all, that's all me. Okay. Um, I, yeah. I do, uh, I do most of our graphic design. Nice. They saves us some money. And, uh, but the problem with that is like with my ADHD, I feel like the visual identity of this band has gone so many places in the last three years. <laughs> Because we're just like, eh, what about this? What about this? Uh, I, I think there's some elements that that we like and that we're that we're sticking with, though. But who knows? You know, the next record we might go like a very, very um, austere sort of. You know, right now I'm doing a lot of a lot of textures, a lot of uh, collage, and like ink. There's an artist called a uh, oh I forget his first name. His last name is Drexler, though. But he's this collage artist that. I was really inspired by when wanting to to create the cover. Um, I think it's Jesse Drexler. Um, Jesse you look Drexler. Him up on IG, he's got. I looked at his stuff. I was at, I was visiting a friend in LA, and she had a coffee table book of his work, and I briefly just like looked through it and was like, "Oh, this I this is it. I love this." And oh, Jesse Drexler, J E S S E D R A X L E R. His stuff is just. For me, at least, it's I find it really, really inspiring. So yeah, I just and that's kind of why we did a sort of this collage of of uh, images on the tower, and then we also wanted oh, we wanted to represent the, yeah, yeah, stuff's cool, right? We wanted to represent that the tower is sort of behind us, that we've gone through this tower moment already instead of looking at the tower, um, and so on the cover. The yeah, it tower almost looks like it's like through a looking image. glass type of thing. Yeah, it? it's so when when you unfold the whole, so you won't be able to on the CD or the um, the vinyl because it's it's not a multi panel thing. Right, uh, it's just the sleeve. But the CD, the insert, if you pull out the insert and you you open it up where you can see the front and the back, um, it's like an old, uh, it's like a classic car. Uh, and it's a it's the rear view mirror on the the passenger side. Oh, um, so oh, it's okay. Yeah, I can see that now. Yeah, yeah, bit. yeah. We kind of did that because we had, we had used that. What was that thing? That six was it a sixty four Cadillac in the Goodbye Horses video? Kevin, do you remember what year that thing was? <laughs> yeah, we used this. I think it was a sixty four Deville. But I I want to if we can continue the classic car aesthetic with this band, I'd like that only just for the, the selfish reason that I would like to rent and drive more cars <laughs> like that to Bill. Yeah, that would, I would uh, honestly be guilty of that too. Yeah. It's like, if you can like, yeah, I'm yeah. on the website. You can man. find an excuse. The original tower T last chance. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was commissioned by a, uh, I think Ben, Oh, I got to get better with these names. Um, well, that's really there's cool. There's a, ta a tattoo artist out of um, out of the UK that we uh, Ben Rose. Ben, Rose. Um, I yeah, I saw their work um, just scrolling around online looking for tower images, and I was like, oh my god, this is this is awesome, and uh, they cut us a really great deal yeah, to be sick. able to use the use the image, yeah. So I was just looking, and I have sort of an off-topic question, but a curiosity question. Did you, you guys have, like, cologne. Did you make that yourself, like, pick all the scents out and everything, or did you just have it kind of put your logo, or put your name and stuff on it? Yeah, yeah, no, I was I was in, um, at a day off uh, in Arizona, I think we were in Phoenix, and I was going, I went to, like, this occult store, like oddities and stuff with, you know, like, um, preserves skulls and all that. And next door there was a perfumery and I'm really self-conscious about my, my scent and body odor. So like when I'm hugging people after a show, I always like, will spray some cologne on beforehand. Uh -huh. And so a lot of people would always say like, Oh, you smell really nice for like having just gotten off stage. And so when I was in this perfumery, I was like, Oh my gosh, that would be so great if when people told me that I smelled nice, I could be like, oh yeah, you can buy it right over there. Um, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> so I was like, well, they based, they did custom sense there, um, but I wanted to do it myself. So I kind of, I just kind of had a micro obsession. Um, 
So got like my wholesaler's license with them and started buying uh, ingredients in bulk and just kind of experimenting and trying to find something that I would wear, um, something similar to some of the clothes that I wore at the time. And yeah, stumbled onto one that was like, yeah, this is this is the one. Luckily, like my wife was having like a, a girl's party. And so there were like eight women in the living room that I was like, I was able to kind of do a t- like a smell test with. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, had a couple of options. I wasn't really sure which one. And uh, I went with the one that all the girls liked. <laughs> and um, so she called the best, uh, Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, that's a great idea, though. You can get it right over there. Yeah, you're the first, I have to say, I'm pretty sure you're the first band that I've seen do that. I've seen barbecue sauce, I've seen beer, <laughs> sandals, never cologne. Normally, like, you said, like you said, you go up to somebody after a show, like, they're stinky, sweaty, you're like, oh, good show, man, and they turn around and you got that, like, Ugh, fucking yeah. wet dripping all over you or and whatever. that's expected, like, you can't even get yeah. mad, that's why everybody's yeah. like, I damn, you know. smell awesome, you know, like... It's just like it's so rare. Other other bands it, take note. You should all have your own cologne. Or or don't take or don't take note. Or so you can <laughs> Or at least get like a hand towel, pat yourself down a little. Yeah, yeah. I'll <laughs> remain stinky. <laughs> Jonathan, earlier you said that when you were a kid you weren't really allowed to listen to too much music. How did you start getting into music then? Uh, I had, I had a friend, so I went to like a private Christian academy and then there's this kid when we were like 13 or 14 who transferred, like moved to town, you know, and came to the school. His name was Dustin and uh, Dustin Hall. And he listened to punk rock and he introduced me to, uh, like against all authority and total chaos and all this stuff that like, I didn't have any idea what was going on, but I knew that like on Friday nights when we would get pizza and be locked in his garage with a couple other kids that we would just blast it and kick the shit out of each other. And it felt like nothing else I had ever experienced. Um, so just got into that. I would wait until, um, wait until my parents went to sleep, uh, and listen to like alternative radio, a girl in my, when I was left at school, I, um, a girl in my journalism class, uh, was she would always sit with her headphones on and one day I just asked her what she was listening to and she was like Deftones and I was like what can I hear um so she put on my own summer and having never listened to the Deftones and hearing my own summer for the first time through headphones it was like a religious experience um just the way that the like the snare just like first comes in and yeah I was just at I'd listened to like distorted guitars before, but it really, that song in that moment, my senior year in high school was probably the moment that I really, really just fell in love with the feeling of like, just something really, really heavy. Yeah. And that's a cool one to listen to in headphones too, because Chino really like throws his vocal around a lot in the mix. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean and does the way always, that... but like that one specifically, like I could, I was playing the song in my head when you said that and it definitely Mm -hmm. there's a lot of left and right mix to it yeah i was just thinking about it too when i first heard it and i was i was pretty young and also in headphones and a little disc man dude it's it's pretty gnarly to hear that for the first time yeah well and you're introduced to like stephen carpenter's like that that guitar line first right with the drums first you get the drum by itself right um but the bass hasn't come in yet it sounds so fucking big just the guitar and the drums and you don't even realize that the bass isn't in there until this fucking crushing chorus comes in with with uh yeah with the vocals and you're at that moment you're just like you know you know when when something already is like giving you chills and you're like oh this is good this is good but then it goes even further than you thought it could and you're just yeah changed it's like that. Uh... And when you're when you're so young, you can have those experiences. Like now, if I have an experience like that, I'm just like, oh, wow, that was such a cool experience. But like when you're like 17, 18, you have an experience like that. Like it changes like your DNA. Yeah. Oh, most definitely, man. That shifts your whole outlook on things, dude, for sure. 
Yeah. It did us. I guarantee it, you know. I've spent my most of my life in musical search of recreating that feeling over and <laughs> over. So Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and it's different for everybody, you know, the, the song or the band or whatever. It's what's so awesome yeah. about it. But it's great when it happens. It just doesn't happen as much as it used to. Like when you're younger and everything's fresh, you're like, Oh, yeah. this is awesome, this is awesome and now it's like, ah, oh, this sounds exactly like that. This sounds like Now you're lucky if you get like it that. every like few years yeah yeah there's like a handful of things that you're like wow this was phenomenal if it can make me stop around my room then i'm good (laughs) that's your level of approval yeah then i'm like oh dude all right cha-ching and then i put it in the the good side do you stop enough to make your records i I do enough to make my kid laugh at me and (laughs) (laughs) i'm like well shit like what if your arm bounces up what's wrong with you grow up (laughs) <laughs> um, what about you, Kevin? What got you into music? Oh, man. Um, honestly, I mean, being like a latchkey kid and also hanging around with like older kids uh, was kind of my upbringing and whatnot. Um, a lot of like skate punk kids and started going to shows real early. Um, first show I went to like with not like with like parents or something was Henry Rollins at probably like 13 years old, got in a pit, jumped off, slapped Henry Rollins on the back, jumped off. <laughs> nice. That's a fucking awesome <laughs> that is a fucking show story. sweet show story. Uh, my mom had me when she was 16. My dad was like 18. They'd have MTV on all the time, you know, back when MTV played music, you know? Yep. And so all that 80s stuff was around me at all times, you know? And then in the 90s, I started playing music and, like I said, going to shows. Um, From there, it was like, so I always had all that 80s new wave, goth, post-punk stuff, like, in the background uh, from the parents, you know, and obviously classic rock and whatnot. But then in the 90s, it was all about, like, my kind of music, you know. It was, like, punk stuff, grunge stuff, obviously, you know, the great, like, hip-hop stuff of that era, Wu-Tang and... I mean, the Beastie Boys and, uh, you know, different, like, Tribe Called Quest and De La Soul and all that stuff, like, really was, like, what was interesting. And from there, like, you know, you just, like I said, you kind of, it slows down a little, but you, every, you know, few years, you get something that comes out that's just great. And like we said earlier, like, moving, pushing, you know, pushing the envelope and pushing the art forward or you know, the sound, whatever that is, forward, you know. So, Most definitely, man. I think the last band that really hit me like that is a band called Show Me the Body out of New York. That's like a kind of throwback to like like pure hardcore with like with like swagger. New York, you know, like lineage type group. Um I don't know if y'all heard them, but they're they're a phenomenal new band. Newish. I haven't, but I'm assuming Jeremy probably has. No, I haven't actually. Oh, that's yeah. surprising. Not that one. There's so dude, there's so many there's yeah, so many exactly. bands really coming hard. out right now that make me stomp around my room, dude. Yeah. Yeah, show me the body's one of those for sure. That's they're, awesome. They're very I'm very I'm hot and very Yeah, I just yeah. I just looked them up and added a couple things. But before we start wrapping stuff up here, um, do you guys have anything that you would like to plug or say or add or anything like that before we finish? We got a fundraiser for the for the European tour uh, at our website, trying to raise some money for that for the upfront costs there and get some more records printed and some shirts out there. Um, more collab, so, right on. Donate, yeah. Pe- <laughs> Is the uh, I see it. Okay. I was looking for the link for it because I'll put it in the episode description so anybody can uh, go right to it from there. Oh, word. That'd be amazing. Yeah, the link is uh, in the five links at, at the top of our Instagram, and it's also on the on our homepage of our website, cool. which is urbanheatband.com. I'll have that in the episode description also. You guys' Instagram and all that stuff, too. Cool. Amazing. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it sounds like, upcoming few months like you guys have a lot planned a lot going on it's going to be busy lots of touring so hopefully like spreads the good word about your music and we'll continue to try to do the same and thank you so very you. so very much yeah absolutely. thank you for um hopping on man 
I appreciate it. Of course, yeah. this has been great. Normally, yeah. we ask people a question at the end of the episode, but you guys sound like you're kind of into a bit of everything. But just for you know, the for sake, the of, sake asking of the it, show, we'll fucking ask it. Um, we always ask people like, what is something that they're into musically that people wouldn't expect, like outside of the genre of music that you play? I'll go first. I love Jason Isbell. Okay, from he was in Drive By Truckers for a while. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's basically like an Americana country artist type, but like I think he's probably, in my opinion, like the best lyrical songwriter of this era for sure. Yeah, I haven't followed much of his solo stuff. I I've heard a couple of the records, but I remember him being a great writer just in general. Yeah. Was that even um, the question? Was it an artist that we were naming, or, or like something not? No, just an oh, yeah. artist, artist, band, whatever. Okay, you know. I thought, I so, thought, I thought that. <laughs> you got it, dude. That, yeah, that you was nailed perfect. It. <laughs> yeah, I don't, you, know my, I don't know if mine would be unexpected. You know, I um, well, I mean, I'm really into Run the Jewels. I've really been enjoying Run the Jewels um, when I'm working out and stuff, and then I listen to like a lot of acoustic like cello music like instrumental cello music um around the house and things but yeah i don't know if any of those would be like unexpected oh i have i mean i, mean, I have some guilty cello pleasure. music would be a little unexpected but... <laughs> okay good i was gonna say i have some guilty pleasures but i'd rather not of myself <laughs> <laughs> oh dude you should totally give us at least one you gotta like clean the house felt... to like britney spears or something something mm- no, I will. There, there's a couple of Limp Bizkit tracks that definitely Ooh. get into my playlist. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Man, I will say, like, is, I, I grew up at that pleasure. time, and like, more people than not liked Limp Bizkit. Like, I don't care what anybody says. Oh, for sure. Mm-hmm. Like, there were yeah, more fans true. than who are the deniers right now. Like, I listened to that shit at the time. Like, well, I'm not I mean, they're having it. another. They're having a moment now. Like. Yeah. Was now it's huge, huge, man. Enough time has passed that they're cool, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Make yeah, no like face. A new, it's like on tour with them. Of them. I've yeah. seen that. Yeah. But I remember, like, when they were up, like, playing Family Values tour and stuff. I mean, I didn't go. I was too young, but I had the poster in my room. Uh, yeah. dude. That, that, that was really. Was the Family Values job. tour? Was that before or after Woodstock? I think that was before. Right after, maybe. Because it was like, like 90, 94. I think, well, yeah, it would have been after then. So it would have been like 97. Well, no, they played the Woodstock 99. So that was before Family Values was before 99. I want to say yes, it was 97. But because it had, I remember like Come Ice on. Cube was on there and a couple other stuff. I'm trying to re imagine. Oh, why did I say Woodstock 94? Fuck, sorry, well, they had me. two of them. But Limp Biscuit wasn't on 94. They wasn't even around yet, I don't think. No, they didn't come out to like 96 or so. I remember when I was a kid and like the first time I seen the fucking Nookie video and Westmoreland's eyes were like all blacked out. Yeah. And I was, yeah. my, my child version of myself was like, oh my God, he took the insides of sunglasses out and like shoved them in his <laughs> eyes. Because I didn't know how the <laughs> fuck he did it. So. <laughs> when I was on a school bus, on a transfer bus from the junior high to the high school, every day. Faith, they would play that song yeah, off the first record song. every day, <laughs> dude. Yeah. It was crazy. But that, like, give me something to break song, like the smash yeah, everything see, or I, whatever. The like Three dollar bill stuff, yards yeah. where cool, I was man. like, I'm, I stopped right there. He the, did some stuff mm-hmm. with Method Man. Yeah. Oh, I remember that. And I was like. I stopped with the chocolate starfish and the hot dog flavored water. Yeah, I was that, done that's where that everybody. Point. Everybody was done yeah. at that point. <laughs> <laughs> but if you were a collector out there and you have an OG press of that. Yeah, that thing's worth a lot of money. Yeah, buy a car. Oh, shit, huh? But all right, guys, we'll um, we'll let you get going, and we appreciate you taking the time to sit and talk with us. It was cool to hear about the band, the albums, you know, shows and everything. Yeah, it was great meeting both of you, and I appreciate your yeah, time. Likewise. Yeah, hopefully oh, um, well. we'll be able to make it in September. I mean, if we can swing it, like, yeah, we'll definitely come down there to check out the show and get a hold of you ahead of time. Yeah, yeah we'll man, keep in contact uh, for sure. Yeah, hit us up. Yeah, uh, there's nothing like like getting to meet folks in person that you that you've done stuff like this with. So we look forward to it. Cool.
All right. Have a good one, guys. I appreciate it again. All right, cheers. Late.